Okay, welcome everyone to my final and tenth lecture on quantum invariance or on quantum topology without topology, as I called it. And yeah, I think today we want, would like to answer at least uh, partially the question how to construct those quantum invariants, right? So remember that this basically was we had some Brouwer type category, whatever, something with cups, caps, crossings, something like that. And, and we want to send it to some appropriate categories or whatever it was, some, some nice additive, K-linear, whatever category, like a fiat fusion or modular category. Okay, and the point is how to construct those functions. So how can we construct the appropriate targets for our type categories, right? So how to construct quantum invariants? That's, uh, that's a question for today. And the final question we would like to answer. And I show you at least how to construct the Valinda categories, which is kind of the, um, yeah, the easiest non-trivial target you would like to construct. And from it, you get to a very famous polynomial, uh, not invariant, the famous Jones polynomial, uh, with colors, if you want. I'm going to explain that. So today I need to be a little bit careful with the scalars. Um, because in some sense, today, today's uh, lecture is only about scalars. So just be called that I have an S, S so a small K and a capital K. And the difference is, um, so maybe I do it this way. I have an S, which is a ring. I have a small K, which is a field. And I have a capital K, which is an algebraically closed field, right? Which is a stronger, just conditions get stronger and stronger. But I also need this funny A, and A is this funny guy. Um, so you can ignore the V over one to one of one. So that I need a square root of V, you can kind of, kind of ignore that. It's because of the braiding, so you can just think there is a V. I will have to drag this V over one over two all the way. Well, we need a braiding, so I have to drag it all the way through the end of the, of the lecture, but you can ignore it, as I said. It's a technicality, forget it. Um, but basically, you have this ring A, which is this one. And the nice thing about this ring is um, that you, from here, you can specialize. You can specialize to anything you want. You can specialize to Q, uh, forward parameter V. You can specialize to whatever FP, uh, V being whatever two, something like that. You can specialize to anywhere you want. The only condition you have is that you want to specialize V, as you can see here, to an invertible parameter. But that's it. Otherwise, you can specialize. That's what I'm going to explain in a second. And that's why we want this ring. And I will always denote it by A. It's kind of the, the integral version. From the integral version, you can go everywhere. That's how you should think about it. Um, so yeah, let's talk a little bit about those specializations. So basically what you have is a pair, S of a ring and well, an element with a square root. Again, ignores the square root, it's just an invertible element in S. And whenever you have such a setup, you can, so A definitely acts on S in, in a very naive sense. Uh, absolutely nothing going on. So V, uh, v acts, it, it's a specialization action. So a V acts as Q. And you can drag this all the way through and you will see that you can always kind of specialize um, your parameters, right? So V equals Q. So um, I call this a specialization or the category specialized at or whatever, depends on it. And basically it's, it's the objects stay the same anyway. They don't, they don't see any, it's, a, it's about the ground ring. It's about the linearity, right? They don't see any, any linearity. So they stay the same. And the home spaces are the specialized ones. And this, I said again, just means that V, you plot in Q, whatever Q B might, might be, right? Q might be whatever, be the element two in FP if you want. And it's just a placeholder system a uh, placeholder symbol for, for anything you want, basically. 
And that's why at the end, I want to start with this ring A because from A, I can go everywhere. Uh, in other words, whatever I say, I can say about morphisms, categories or whatever regarding A will specialize to anything else, anything you want. And that's pretty cool. And that's why people like this case uh, for A, which is usually called the integral case. So that's why I'm going to call it the integral case. Um, yeah, so this lemma just says everything works as, as I just explained. More importantly, you have a few cases I would like to distingu uh, distinguish. The integral case, okay? That's, that's really A. Or if you don't like quantum, then you can think of, of uh, S being just the integers and Q is one or plus minus one. So it doesn't, doesn't really exist. Minus one is a little bit nasty because you assign everywhere, but it's, it's not that bad. Um, so if you don't like Q, then just think of it being, being one. So that's the integral case. And from here, you can go everywhere, right? That's the whole point. It's, it's like it's like a source, right? The next interesting case is a generic case. And I will also say generically. And that's basically, um, it's basically, well, here are the cases, but basically um, Q is a formal parameter, formal, right? You just adjoin a transcendental number that's basically what you do to your round field. And uh, the point is in this setup, so we will see that cancellations are the problem uh, in the non semi simple case with respect to what I'm going to say. And if Q is formal, like uh, transcendental something, then there can't be any cancellations and you're fine and everything's kind of easy. And then it kind of depends a little bit. So cancellations um, happen in the other cases. In my cases, three, four, and five. And basically, that's something like um, you have a characteristic uh, P field. So K is my characteristic P field, and Q is plus minus one. So that's bad because, in this case, for example, um, you can get cancellations because actually your calculation would say you get five as a result. Let's say you do a calculation, you get five as a result. But five is zero model of uh, in FP in F five, so you, you might get cancellations or or um, although you don't want to have any generic I'm speaking, and the same can happen in all the other cases. So that's a complex root of unity case, and it's just two squared of order L. So it's, it's a root of unity, right? And some mixed case where, well. So in, in the root of unity case, or the complex root of unity case, the ground field is whatever, let's say of characteristic P is, is of characteristic zero, which basically means it's C, right? Whatever, so that's why I call it complex root of unity case. Um, and in this case, I just have any field of characteristic P. And it's kind of, so integral is from, uh, it's kind of separate. So you can go from integral to everywhere else, and then it has an in decreasing danger level. So generic, no, no, not much danger. It's easy. It's usually semi-simple and so on. And then it gets more complicated. Not quite because those two should be uh, swapped. So finite characteristic is more complicated than the complex quantum group case. But otherwise, um, kind of you should think of case two being danger level low and all the other cases, high danger level. You have to be careful what you do. Exactly because of those vanishing um, of, of um, numbers, basically. So um, here comes a legal choice for my specialization. I could take S, for example, this is always confusing, so let me just say it explicitly. I could take it to be Z with a formal adjoint parameter, and I then just specialize V to my formal adjoint parameter. That's, that's completely fine. Well, this was supposed to be a Q. That's completely fine. Yeah. And this, that's kind of the most generic case you can think of. Your field is easy, it's, it's complex numbers, and not and your, um, your, your Q doesn't do anything bad because it's a formal parameter. And the philosophy I want to sell, you will see that in action, 
is that whenever you have a category defined integrally, okay, so over A, and you have an integral basis and everything is integral, um, then what you should look for are pseudo idempotents. And what are pseudo idempotents? Pseudo idempotents are the so idempotent would be e squared equals e, and the pseudo idempotent is e squared equals the scalar times e, and a is some scalar oh, from a, right? Uh, from a. And this is, in some sense, good news, because if you have something like that, you could call this whatever the eigenvalue of e. Right. If you think of E as being a projector, then or a pseudo projector, then this is really the eigenvalue of E. And you want to get rid of this eigenvalue and want to make it one. How do we do that? Well, if E squared satisfies A times E, then E over A squared will be E over E over A. E over a. So this would be an idempotent. For, for pseudo idempotents, you get idempotents if you can invert the eigenvalue. And this won't be always the case. You, sometimes you can't invert the eigenvalue. And the point is, generically, you always can invert the eigenvalue. And then you get nice defined eigenvalues. Um, so let's, let me run you through a prototypical example. So what's going on? So um, I take the, uh, the group ring of S3, integrally defined. Right? And what I care about are idempotents in this group ring. And I know that S3 basically looks like this, right? You have one, uh, you have the one which are just three strands, you have S1, uh, you have T, uh, you have S and T, which just are just the swappings and the corresponding compositions of those guys. And that's it, so six, six elements and here you go. And if you want to write down idempotents in this, well, we learned from um, from before, from last lecture, basically, um, and the lecture before, that what we were looking for would be orthogonal idempotents. And we want them to be complete, which would mean the sum of the idempotents is identical. Here, because we are working with pseudo idempotents, we only get something that's called pseudo complete. So the sum of the idempotents is a scalar times idempotents. Okay, and then you do this calculation in the Z and you get well those idempotents. And I've marked for you the eigenvalues. So here have eigenvalue six, yeah, six. That's the red eigenvalue. And the other one have eigenvalue three. Three and six. And that's good news. So as long as um, your ground field, if you would go to a ground field now, has uh, not characteristic two or three, you're, you're happy. You just invert three and six and everything's fine. Um, in characteristic three, you're really skewed. <laughs> you can, can invert absolutely nothing and all of them die. In characteristic two, you're kind of partially skewed. You can at least invert the, um, uh, the green ones. And that's exactly what's going on. So if you remember my example from before, uh, when, I, when I did this case, uh, so the representations of S3, the only difference that, that appears are for, for, for something like this, right? for uh, F2 or F. In C, everything's fine. Of course, you can just do one over six and one over three. No problem. In F2, you can do one over three, but not a one over six. One over six doesn't work. Of course not, because it would be divisible by, by whatever it is. And um, in the final case, F3, you are just you're just super unlucky and you you oh, you, you can invert absolutely nothing. Uh, so there's neither one over six nor is there one over three. And it turns out that in uh, over F2, um, the regular representation 
has really two components, the trivial one, uh, the projective cover of the trivial one, and the projective cover of the of, of S. And over S3, you have a similar decomposition, but a slightly different one. So this is S. This is the one that corresponds to S. And this one completely, completely doesn't make any sense anymore in characteristic three. But it, at least those two, so this will be the projective cover of one. And this will be the projective cover of the sign representation. And those still make sense. They just they, they're just not as easy as um, as here. Okay, so um, that's a story for S three and why you should be careful with pseudo eigenvalues. Sometimes they just you want to divide by the eigenvalue, but if the eigenvalue is zero in your field, then you just can't divide by your eigenvalue. Right? I hope that makes some sense. Okay, um, let's go on. And I, I basically, the, the plan for the rest of this of this lecture is to do this for our Rumatelaval category. This was TL with various parameters. This was this category with uh, cups, caps, uh, whatever, and crossing those crossing those uh, matching things, and we will construct from it Jones type invariants. So let's have a look. So. Um, I have this temporally deep, the rumor Telaval category, temporally deep category, whatever. I have it over a ground ring A, and my circle value was uh, something like minus V, minus V inverse. Yeah. And I, I want it to be whatever, whatever it is. It's, it's linear and additive and whatever you want it to be. And I want to play the following trick. Okay. So, um, I guess formal definition, but it's, it's best explained in an example, actually. So let's have a look at the example. So I want to, to, to consider a path, and I want to consider a path on a line. Okay, and my line has certain points, whatever, one, two, three. Okay, and I consider a path, and I call them pi. And the only requirement I have for my path is that it basically goes like this. Then can go back and can go forth again and again one step further, like like down here, like this one. And the only requirement I have is that each step ends in one of my vertices, and I will never never go into the negative region. It's, it's only a positive thing. And I call them non-negative paths for exactly that reason. Um, and they're really just. We, I think of them as honest paths, and here's my notation. Epsilon one goes to so epsilon one goes to the to the right, and epsilon minus one goes to the left. So epsilon one, here's epsilon minus one, here's another epsilon one, here's another epsilon one. Okay, and here's another example. Um the non-example, this doesn't work. Why? Because I'm if I would start with epsilon minus one first, and then I would do epsilon one, then I would have crossed into the negative region. I don't want that. I only want non-negative things. But otherwise, any kind of pass is allowed. And the number of symbols you use is, of course, the length. Right? If you do five steps, then you have done uh, the pass of length five. And to such a pass, I want to associate certain operators as follows. And it's again best explained in an example, but let's have a look first. So whenever you have a morphism and you do a, a step in this direction, and this was this color in my, my rotation from above, then what you do is you take your morphism and you just pull a strand next to it and you get a new morphism. If you happen to go in this direction, then you take your morphism and you pull a strand out of it and you get a new morphism. These are the two operations. And you just concatenate them from left to right if you move along your path. And now you might, well, now it gets a little bit clearer why I want this non-negativity because this operation needs non-negativity. Needs, I want to have a st string which I want to pull to the right to close it up, right? And um, 
uh, where I am in in this in this uh, combinatorics, basically, and not just basically, it, it is the number of strands that you see. So if you are in step five hundred and six on position twelve, then you have twelve strands, and this need so this needs this no negativity, um, this no negativity. The other one always makes sense, but I want to the, the second one to be defined. Again, it's a, let me say it again, it's not hard operation. Whenever you go plus or epsilon one, you add a strand. Whenever you go epsilon minus, you pull out a strand and, and cap it off. All right. And from this, you can define what I call an integral ladder. So to, to each pass, you have an integral ladder by just reading it. And I call it a downward one um, because as you will see an example why I call it, why I call it downward. It, it, go, it goes smaller. It has a fewer number of strands. And there's similarly an upward one, which is just a reflection of the downward one. So here's this picture it explains how to go from upward to downward. And the way to build them is also easier than it looked like in the, def in the formal definition. It just works like this. Okay, so you fix your pass. So here I have one, 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 one. Okay, so you start with empty. You see a one, you add a strand. Then you see a one, you add a strand. You see a one, you add a strand. You see a one, you add a strand. And yes, that's what you end up with. So this is kind of the easy one. And whatever you see at the top here, that's what you call lambda, and this is lambda equals four. Okay. Um, so let me do another one for you. Let me do this one, for example. How does it work? Okay, I see a one. So this is one, one minus one, minus one. I see a one, I put a strand. I see a one, I put a strand. I see a minus one. So I take the, the rightmost strand, I cap it off. I see a minus one, so I take the rightmost strand and I cap it off. And this is exactly this diagram. And in this case, the lambda at the top here, you don't reach anything, so lambda is zero. Okay. Very easy algorithm. Just if you have plus, add a strand. If you have a minus, cap off a strand. And the point is, these elements define you an integral basis, which I call integral ladder. By just taking a down diagram, so down ladder, and I draw it like this because it gets thinner, as you can see. Down things get thinner, so you have fewer lambdas. You could have have the same number of lambdas, but you, the number of strands lambda can get can get uh, uh, lower. You can have the same number but never a bigger number. So I think of it like it is trapezoid and it, it gets thinner in the middle and you put on it an up diagram, which gets then again thicker, it starts off thin. And that's the basis which I denote by, um, by this symbol, C lambda uh, up and down. And the lambda is this thing in the middle. Also lambda is C in the middle. Yeah. And it's indexed by pass. So here's a pi and here's a pi prime. Okay, and this is how it works. Basically, you, you cut your diagram in half here, whatever, here, and so on. You put it put an up diagram at the top, you put a down diagram at the bottom, you stack them together whenever it works, and you get all of these diagrams here. Um, some of them are symmetric. If you put the same up diagram, so here D and it's basically D flipped, but they don't have to be symmetric. You can do something like this. But just all possibilities to stick those diagrams together. And this is my basis. Um, here's another example. It's exactly the same. It also works for different home spaces. So if you want to go from two to four, from two to four at the top, you cut your diagram in the middle, you have a down diagram and you have an up diagram. And this defines your, you look at the middle, in the middle you see a lambda and this defines your C lambda uh, up down. Yeah. Um, and the theorem is that this forms a basis. That's not completely obvious, um, but it's also not super hard to show.
And this is a basis over A. So this is an A basis, which means it's a good one. It specializes to everything else, right? So this gives you a basis for any, for any ground ring. Okay. It gives the basis for any S. Um, and I call it the, accordingly, I call it the integral ladder basis, the integral basis of the technology branch of R. And it's really built by this bottom neck principle. Um, yeah. And I should have done this Uppsala. So lambda is at the bottom, and my pi is at the top. So this notation is exactly swapped, whatever. Um, and this is a bottleneck neck principle that you should remember, right? You go down, fewer number of strands, you see something in the middle and then you blah, thank you. Yes. Mm. All right, the following lemma is not so important. Uh, the following two lemmas are actually not so important, but basically it's a, whenever you stick, Two such diagrams together, you see something of the same uh, of the same lambda, but you might end up seeing so lambda is a number of through strands, and you might see something for a smaller lambda, but you don't have you don't really need to worry about it. It's like up to higher order terms. You're making a kind of a, a linear approximation, and linear is good enough, and you don't care for higher order terms. And these higher order terms for me are always denoted by i bigger than something whatever here in this case bigger than you and that's easy to see because you kind of always go get thinner um for example here and the point is yeah well you stack them together you get a diagram and you will see um that the diagram is of the same size and the nice thing is that you never change top or bottom so top or bottom stay the same top and bottom stay the same and this happens on exactly the right level. Uh, if you happen to go lower, top or bottom don't need to stay the same, but on the correct level, um, top and bottom stay the same. And the level here is just of course the same lambda. So if you don't, if you don't end up here, so this is kind of a little bit crazy, you don't have much control, but if you end up here, um, then, then everything's fine. Okay. Um, and this is a really nice integral basis. So here you get the integral basis with this nice property that um, if you stack two base elements together and you stay with the same number of through strands, so lambda is number of through strands, and through strands are just strands that go through, right? no, no, no caps and caps, um, then actually you never have to touch top or bottom. Okay, and now let's talk about idempotence. That's that's what we want. We want idempotence in the in the uh, Teller Weil category, in the Teller Leap category, and they are called Jones tensile idempotence. And it works as follows. So um, we need a little bit of notation. We need this quantum binomial. Um, if you've never seen that before, it doesn't matter. It is an A, and for v equals one. So if I put specialize v to one, then it's just a binomial. Just A over B. It's a numerical thing that you need, and you basically need to divide by those things. Okay, so um, if you go through it, um, I have given you some examples through all the different cases. What what is really worrisome usually is if those things vanish, like like in, in these cases, and otherwise it doesn't really matter. And you can get crazy things here because it's quantum, so you can get whatever. Something that looks a little bit like 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 um, like the golden ratio, not quite. Let's call it the golden ratio prime. Um, it's a it's a second solution to the golden ratio equation, um, but that doesn't really matter. It just gives you different scalars. What really matters is whether they die or not. And you can see it here. That it happens from time to time, uh, and you have to be really careful when those things die. But the point is. This never happens generically. And that's the whole point. 
So binomials do not die, right? And you know that. If you work with a C or whatever, some countering of characteristic zero, the binomial is not zero. It will be a huge number, whatever, 5,000. That's, that's probably not a binomial. But anyway, um, you know what I mean. Um, and it will be just not zero. It's just a huge number. But in characteristic P, your binomial might be divisible by P. And this happens very, very often. And it's then zero. But you want to divide by it. You're in trouble. This is why you have to be careful about binomials. And in the quantum case, it's just quantum binomials. Uh, don't, don't, don't worry, it's not, not so important. Uh, the, the, the point is, there are those numbers that are given by binomials, and you want to invert them. You really need to invert all of them and up to a certain i, and I call this a upper i. So it, I, I invert all those um, binomials up to a certain point. And if I do that, I can define idempotents. Basically, what I get are pseudo idempotents, and I need to divide by those numbers to make them idempotents. Yeah, and that's where I need uh, to invert those things. And how does it work? Well, uh, the, the 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 construction is as follows. We have, and we've seen this last time. We've seen an example of these. This is what I, I think I showed you the second, the third Jones Maxwell idempotent. In general, the East Jones Wenzel item potent, um, or just GV for short, is a certain endomorphism, which I just denote by a box. It's an endomorphism of, 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 of uh, I bullets, so it's, it's I strands. And it's an endomorphism satisfying, well, it's an item potent. Is an item potent. So diagrammatically, if I stick a box on another box, <laughs> then um, yeah, I get a box again. Um, it annihilates caps and caps. Diagrammatically, it's, it's exactly this. If I have a box and I stack a cap on it, it's zero. And the co if you express it in terms of the integral basis, then the identity appears with coefficient one, which just means this is a placeholder symbol for a huge linear combination, as we've seen last time. Uh, but the only really thing you know about it is that the identity appears with scalar one and you have absolutely no idea what's going on. But you, in some sense, also don't need to. The only thing you would, you would need to prove are two things. So if it exists, it's unique. And that's, that's an easy argument. You can read it, it's really simple. If it exists, it's unique. It's a little bit like with universal properties, right? If if they if you have something with a universal property, it's easy to see that it is unique. It's unique up to applied to Um And the crucial thing is existence. And the point is this proposition for which I don't know really easy proof, so I don't give any register reference. So they exist, they are unique, and they exist which is exactly what, what you want, of course, right? So there's a unique item potent with this property, with those properties, and um, yeah, there's unique item potent with those properties, and it's called the jones Wenzel projector. And here it's really, really crucial to work over AI. So you really need to invert those, those quantum binomials. Otherwise, this thing does not exist. Because basically, in the proof, you write down a pseudo item potent and then you divide by those things. Okay. That's what you do. Anyway, we have those item potents and they are given by some diagrammatic rules. And the point is, I don't want you to express, ever write them down explicitly because um, they just explode. There's just too many of them. They have just too many summons. So don't write them down in terms of uh, uh, those, those nice diagrams here. But just treat them as boxes with formal pro properties. So let's try to do that. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. Yeah, they have longish expressions. I'm I'm I'm, I'm very <laughs> kind here. They they are horrible. Okay, so just don't do this. Use the abstract properties. Okay, and here are some abstract abstract properties you would like to use. The first one is if you have a um, an EI somewhere. And you have an EJ somewhere, and you want to put something in between, whatever it is, then this can't work. This can only work if i is equal to j, in which case only the identity diagram fits in between, and otherwise it's always zero. 
So the home spaces between those are really, really tiny. Okay. That's a really nice property to, to work with because you can't draw diagrams between them, right? So this, this is good. Um, they absorb one another. So if you have a bigger one and you have a smaller one sitting on the top, then the smaller one is just eaten by the bigger one. So the, it's like, like the big fish always eats the small fish and it's the same thing. So the big one, the blue one always eats the small ones. And it doesn't matter where you hit it, you can hit it to the left, you can hit it to the right, you can hit it in the middle, it's gone. It will be absorbed, it will be eaten. And you have some other nice properties. You have a recursion formula and the kind of equivalently you have a partial trace map. Okay, partial trace properties, absorption properties, the home value shown. Right? So you know that the thing exists, you give it a notation, you call it a box, and you basically calculate with, um, with uh, these properties. That's basically what you did. Um, I kind of sketch a proof here, or I actually give a proof, but it's not so important. It's, it's completely diagrammatic, um, diagrammatic algebra to pilot, basically. Um, okay, so they have nice traces. This is what this exercise says, and uh, well, this lemma, which I secretly is, of course, an exercise because I say this is exercise, whatever. Um, yeah, it's, it's really easy to do. just do it. It's, it's nice. It's, it's really not hard. And it gives you a feeling how to calculate with boxes. Because it, it, I don't know, well, maybe you're much quicker than I, I uh, was, but um, first time I always try to expand them and then calculate with them. Don't do that. Just they're boxes with certain properties. Work with boxes. It's much better. It's much better, I promise you. And if I invert everything, um, the AG, so just invert all binomials, I call it the generic ground ring. Because in this case, all Jones Venzel projectors exist. Right. And you can actually uh, copy the strategy from above. So nothing has changed here. It's exactly the same as I showed you above um, where I constructed the, the integral basis. It's exactly the same picture. So let me scroll up. I'm already scrolling up. It's exactly the same picture. The only difference is that I now stack in, in each step, I stack in my, my projectors. But otherwise, it's the same idea. You have a path going somewhere, something like that. Probably I, I got the colors now wrong, whatever. You have a pi. Uh, for each pi, you get such an operation. For each operation, you write down an, a morphism. Uh, for each morphism, you just write down the corresponding element. And the only difference is now in each step, you stick in one of those, pro those projectors of the course of, of the right size, right? If you, if you, yeah, so, so this is how it works basically. So you, you read off your sequence. So like, like E1, uh, just one, 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 for example, and then we have a few more examples here. So what do you do? You start with a line, you read one. Okay, you put a projector and put a line. You, you, you read two, so you put a line and put a projector and you read one again and you put a line and you put a projector. That's the one operation. And you put a line and you put a projector. And because you, they all each one another, in the end, this is just one big projector. So the basis element for the one, 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 one pass is just, is just a box. Here's another example. So let's do this one together. So we had here the uh, plus the, the one, one, minus one, minus one pass. So how does that work? OK, it works like this. So let's do it. Uh, you see a one, you put a string. You see a one, you put a string, but you need a projector now. You see a minus one, you pull out a lag. You see, and you would put a projector here, but it's a small projector. And you see a minus one, you pull out the lag, and then you are done. And you get this picture. Where I, just to make sure um, we are on the same page, I added the zero projector, at the zero box at the top, but this is just empty. Okay, you can, you can ignore that. But it's kind of the same. But instead of counting the number of strings you end in, um, you kind of end in the projector. And you get now a, a basis in exactly the same way. Same diagram, same hourglass procedure uh, defines your basis, same properties, uh, and so on. Um, 
So it's the same basis. But the point is this only works away. And it's in some sense a much nicer basis because this is a basis, the Atim Wedderburn basis that decomposes everything into, into composable, into, into the sounds. But it's built from the same strategy. You pick a pass, you go left and right, you look what you do, and you, you just do the combinatorics. And for each such pass, you, you, you can get the corresponding idempotent by just taking C lambda pi pi. Okay, and C lambda pi pi is, is then exactly the idempotent that projects to whatever you see in the middle in the corresponding um, temporal uh, like whatever, depending on many strengths you have, it will project to a certain direct summit in, in so there's lambda in this type of thought. Uh, no, sorry, this is not lambda, this is the length of pi. But otherwise, the, the, the procedure is the same. And they define for you uh, a complete set of orthogonal idempotents. So now I've constructed all the idempotents for you. So what do, you, do they do? Well, I, I told you there are those projectors, the boxes. And you don't want to expand the boxes, but they exist, they have so nice properties. From the boxes, I use this strategy of, of, of walking along uh, something like that. And I got e pies, and these are exactly my projectors. Um, and the proof is surprisingly simple if you know the construction. Of course, I will omit it, uh, but it, it's not that bad. And the point is then the following. So in this rumatella weil category, if you do the algebraic part, then actually um, what you can do is in, in, in the closure now, this guy here, I, th I think they are isomorphic to the images of those projectors, the direct sum over all possible paths of the images of those projectors. Right? So these are really the primitive idempotents splitting everything. But it only works generically, of course, because otherwise those things are not necessarily defined. And these are exactly the simple, the simple constituents of the Weber Lee Um And you're almost, almost non-redundant, you can say um, those things are equivalent if and only if they have the same lengths, which I call the weight. So the same numbers, uh, they, they end in the same thing. Oh, uh, they end in the same thing. That's, that's, not, that's not the length, that's the weight. I'm sorry. They end in the same thing. I, and the proof is not hard. Again, I'm going to ignore it because we already run badly on time. Um, and the point is, to, now you can use this to show that this thing is semi-simple if and only if all binomials are invertible. Right? So all quantum binomials are invertible, then you can use this crap here you see the temporal leap algebra, everything splits into simples, and you are happy. And in this case, those item points are exactly the item points you need. Okay. Proof not very exciting, not very hard. I write it down. Uh, have a look. So um, what I've done so far is I constructed the semi-simple temporal leap, the, 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 the primitive item points in the semi-simple temporal leap case. They're basically given by those boxes plus some pass combinatorics, right? Don't worry about it too much if it's too much combinatorics for you. That's something you just do in an example and then, then, then you will get the point. I have plenty of examples here. And it turns out that this happens if and only if those guys here, the quantum binomials are invertible. That's what I want, invertible. Okay, so you might ask what happens actually if things are not invertible. Right? 
Um, and you write down the same kind of the same table, you wonder about vanishing of, of uh, quantum binomials or special cases first, quantum numbers. And you call this the quantum characteristic, the Q characteristic of specialization. It's so the characteristic of specialization is basically how often you, you, you can add one, right? So how often you can add one before you get zero. Uh, this is of course P. So there would be a characteristic, let's say if you would add one P times and you do exactly the same, but you hide everything in a quantum bracket and it's called the quantum characteristic. And depending on your quantum characteristic, things might die. And this is, this is always a problem, okay? Here's an example. So we would have, um, let's say K is the field with 13 elements and you choose Q to be two. Um, this is, this case, you will see that you get zero, one, so zero is zero. This is a kind of a boring thing. So one, nine, two, nine, one, oh, you hit zero. So quantum characteristic is six. Okay, so it's very easy. You just count um, when your quantum numbers die. Um, and the point is, well, of course, if the quantum characteristic is zero, then those quantum numbers are never zero. Okay, they're never zero. Um, and you have some other cases for, 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 quantum characteristic being P and quantum characteristic being something positive. It's not so hard. The point is, um, if this is zero, then they never die. And if they never die, then the binomial doesn't vanish. So that's what I do here. And it works as follows. Okay. Um, so you have those Arctic expansions. Okay, and um, you can basically read off from those Arctic expansion, periodic expansion when the binomial dies. So let me just do, here's the lemma, so we can, we can read it. Um, let me just do, so it, it, it all boils down to what is called the quantum Lucas theorem. Um, and I will explain it in an example because it's easier to see, but it's basically a, a numerical condition for when your quantum binomials die. And it works as follows. So you, you really want to know when those things are zero or not, because those are those cases where we don't get those idempotents, the eigenvectors, as the eigenvalues of those idempotents are not very fine. And what you do is, um, for example, in characteristic P, you would just write uh, A periodically, so A, will, A whatever, AR up to A0, and you would do the same for B, uh, BR up to B0, and this is a periodic extension. So uh, this is A0 times P to the zero up to AR times P to the R, and all of those things, so the A case and the B case the same are elements from zero to P minus one. And what you do is um, you then, then this binomial here, the one you are interested in, is just a product of the binomials along the digits. That's what it is. A very nice and very simple uh, description of, of binomials. And if you split a big binomial into a product of small binomials, then it's easy kind of to check uh, when this is zero or not, right? It's a product. You basically need to check that the, the corresponding uh, uh, factors are not zero. Okay, I do an explicit example here. And the point is, um, this, is this, this happens if and only if um, we are in the generic case. For all other cases, might it be the complex quantum group case might it be the uh, characteristic D case or whatever? It's just never simple. Anyway, um, so you would need to have to come up with a new strategy to define idempotents. Uh, anyway, not so important. So let's 
um, just keep that in mind. Only generically you're happy, otherwise it's just not so nice. It gets, it gets harder. Um, okay, so let me finish by constructing well indicators for you. And it will boil down to using the joint function projectors. So um, the, the only need, notion you need is you need a notion of a quotient of a character. Um, that's usually easy, you quotient home spaces, but now you're in the monoidal setup, you, so you want to monoidal notion of that. And I call them uh, uh, a collection of subspaces, a monoidal ideal or a tensor ideal, if exactly this holds. So you have a G, so it's an ideal in both directions. It's an ideal in this direction and then it's an ideal in this direction. So if you have a G in my ideal, then you can flank G with anything outside of the ideal and it's still in the ideal, like an ideal. Similarly, uh, so this is one direction. Similarly, you can do it in the other direction. Okay. Not very hard. Um, uh, not very surprising. That's exactly what you would like to define. And if you have that, you can define a quotient category, which will still be um, in the usual sense. So this proposition is just saying what you should expect. So um, if you have such an ideal, you can define a quotient category, which is still monoid. Not, not hard. And if it was, that's all point, if it was braided or whatever to begin with, then so it's a quotient. Not, not too bad. So what you should look for are those, um, I will skip this example, are those um, uh, ideals, because ideals give you quotients. It's exactly like for algebras, right? Uh, ideals in algebras give you quotients. Okay. Um, but what you then do is you want to pick out a nice quotient and it's called the negligible quotient. Uh, so negligible, you have the notion of left negligible or right negligible, and this means um, so amorphism F is called negligible in the right category if, so I have my F here and I uh, flank it with a G and I take the trace in the, in the corresponding direction and this is zero for all G. So it's negligible if, if you trace it for all G, either left or right, um, then, then it's zero. And negligible is something that is left and right negligible. And in most cases, I don't need to worry about um, uh, left and right traces anyway, so I would just call it negligible. And the point is the category of negligible proof is easy, proof is diagrammatics. Um, the point is the, the, the collection of negligible morphisms is, is, a, is, a, is an ideal. So you can take a quotient. So you can take a quotient by those negligible morphisms. And this is exactly how we would define the, the Valinda category. So the Valinda category is um, um, take the Rumatella Val category for some specialization. So this is usually not semi simple, okay? As I just explained above, it all depends on the vanishing of the binomials. And you, you quotient by the, by the ideal of negligible ones. So trace zero, basically. Not quite right, trace for everything zero, but anyway, um, maybe I should do that. So in my blue box is basically anything I want. Um, and this is a well category for the choice of specialization. In the generic case, this is boring because there are no negligible morphisms. So uh, this is zero. Um, that's an exercise that you can try to do. In the generic case, you have no negligible morphisms. Uh, so this is zero and this is just everything, okay? But um, what is more important is for any specialization, this quotient is semi-simple. You kind of you, you kind of got rid of everything bad, right? You got rid of everything bad. Okay. 
So you got rid of the bad stuff. Um, and you get a you get a ribbon modular category. That's pretty amazing. That's exactly the value in your category. Um, I admit the proof. So let me summarize. Um, so what you get is that the quantum invariance, so you get this modular category, and remember modular categories give you nice invariance. And the quantum invariance arising from those Fellini categories are those generalized Jones polynomials. You can use them for uh, three manifolds and so on and so on. Um, um, you can do higher versions of that using whatever, or different types of versions using other Brouwer category things, quantum Brouwer categories, or something I'm going to explain in a, in a future video, you can use wraps, wrap diagrams to define higher quotients of these. Um, but let me just summarize, so here's some nice examples, and then uh, we are done. I'll stop the list of references. So what, what I've showed you today is how to construct those Valenti categories by using Einapotent in the uh, Tempali Leap in the rumor teller vial or Tempali Leap calculus. And this is how you define all of those Valenti quotients. They're all modular categories, they're all nice, they all give you um, nice uh, quantum invariants. And that's basically it. So I explained in this lecture series uh, what a quantum invariant is supposed to be in this categorical language, try to avoid as much as possible any kind of topo topology, you just try to use some kind of algebraic um, machinery to define those quantum invariants. And what I did today was a completely algebraic machinery, right? I wrote down idempotents. Um, I would have checked um, uh, traces on those idempotents. I would have, uh, I basically then, so what I basically then did is I killed all those idempotents with bad traces. I call this negligible quotient. What comes out is uh, a quantum invariant, this Valinda category, which gives you then topological invariants. Which I think is pretty amazing because, in the end, I haven't done any any topology. I just set up the right language in the first few lectures, kind of the right categorical language. In the past five lectures or so, um, the more the algebraic language, and they both come together in construction of quantum invariants. I just showed you one way to construct those well in the categories. In any case, I hope you enjoyed this lecture series. Um, in the future, I would like to do a second part of it, uh, mostly about webs or something like that. So how you can construct even more quantum invariants, how this is related to representation theory and to algebra and to category theory. Um, but yeah, that's it. I hope you enjoyed the video and uh, I hope to see you in, in another video.